All righty. First thing I'd like to do is welcome the SEC media to Dallas, Texas. This is an awesome opportunity, I think, for, uh, for the state of Texas, for y'all to be here to join us. And uh, what a stage this has been and what a, what a journey it's been to get to this point. I want to hit on a couple things before we get going. Um, you know, when I was a young coach, my first job as a graduate assistant was at USC under Pete Carroll. And uh, there was a tight end coach there who was a young coach as well by the name of Lane Kiffin. And um, his father, Monty, took me under his wing every time he came to town. And uh, we talked football. And I learned more about Tampa 2 than anybody. So anybody who's playing me, please play Tampa 2 because I can tell you exactly who's supposed to go, where, how, and why because that's who Monty Kiffin was. He was so detailed. He was a genuine man. He cared for all of those that nobody cared about. And uh, it's, a, it's a dear loss not only for the sport of football, um, but it's a dear loss for me and I know for Lane and, and my condolences to the Kiffin family on that. Um, the next thing is thoughts and prayers with those affected by Hurricane uh, Burl uh, in Houston in all effective areas. Um, we're still thinking of you. We're praying for y'all. I know it's, uh, it's had a lot of impact on a lot of people. And this time of year with the hurricanes, we are, we're definitely thinking of y'all uh, and, our, and our prayers are with you. Um, the next I want to talk briefly about Coach Saban. Coach, I see you. Um, I know everybody's been coming up talking about you, but... Uh, and I know you've impacted a lot, of, a lot of people who have been up on this stage. No one have you impacted more than me. Uh, I would not be standing here today without you and what you've, what you've meant to my career, uh, to my life. And um, I can't thank you enough. And the impact that you've had on our game uh, has been second to none. And uh, I just can't thank you enough. I want to be able to publicly do that to you, Coach. Thank you very, very much. Um, next thing I want to shift gears to is talk a little bit about uh, a couple weeks ago in Austin, Texas, and we had our SEC celebration, and uh, what a celebration it was. And you could feel the excitement from Longhorn Nation, the fact that we get to be here today, uh, this fall, playing in, in the Southeastern Conference is tremendous. Um, that was a tremendous event. I was shocked, uh, quite frankly, at the amount of people and the pageantry that, that, that was there that day. Um, it gave me a little sense and a feel of what goes on outside of DKR on game day that I normally don't get to be part of. Um, and that wouldn't happen without the leadership of, of President Jay Hartzell, chairman of our board, Kevin L. Tyfe, and our athletic director, Chris Del Delconi. Uh, their vision to take the University of Texas into the Southeastern Conference was one that uh, took a lot of foresight. I wish they maybe would have informed me before I took the job that this is what we were going to do. Um, but uh, I didn't get informed that until afterwards. But I said, hey, we already had to build a team that was going to have to beat the best team in the SEC if we wanted to win a national championship. So not much had to change there for us on that front. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to thank Commissioner Sankey, uh, his guidance, his leadership. Um, to be part of this with him, uh, what he's been able to do in this conference to put it on the forefront, on the national stage, uh, has been tremendous. And I, I was just joking with him in the back. So we, we flew in this morning, we landed, and uh, we get off the plane, we get in the Sprinter van, and we got a police escort to media days. <laughs> If it, it, it just means more, I mean, it just means more right there. The fact that we had a sprinter van with a, with a police escort to, to come to this was, was tremendous. As far as our transition in the, in the Southeastern Conference, I think the key word is respect. We have a ton of respect for this conference. We have a ton of respect for the teams, the coaches, the players, and the fans. Um, this is the elite conference in college football, and, and we're fortunate enough to, to be part of it. Uh, I, I, and we won't do anything without having a level of respect of who we play, where we're playing them, the types of players that they have, the coaching that they have. And I think on the flip side of that, we have to go earn their respect. We're not going to get anything in this deal. Nothing's going to be free, okay? We're going to have to go earn the respect of our opponents, the opposing coaches, the opposing fans, um, and that's going to be our. That's going to be kind of on the forefront of what we do. Um, but the beauty of this conference is really the pageantry. You know, I've been fortunate enough to have spent three years in the Southeastern Conference. Um, the pageantry of the games, the stadiums that you get to play against, the, the iconic programs, that's the beauty of the Southeastern Conference. And, and uh, the 
fact that we get to be part of it now, it's finally here, uh, is pretty exciting. Uh, it's, tr it's, uh, it's just a great opportunity. As far as our team goes, I think this team has been really, really focused. You know, it's been a long time coming for Texas to get back to this stage. Um, last year was a tremendous run. Um, we fell short in the semifinals in the Sugar Bowl, coming off of being Big 12 champions. Um, we, set a, we set a school record with 11 players drafted in the NFL draft, and that, that's a real credit not only to our coaches for trying to recruit good players, but I think to the development of our players in our program, not only on the football field, but in the weight room, in the classroom, and in life, uh, that, the, that the NFL sees players in our program that can come in uh, and enhance their teams to help them try to go win a Super Bowl. Um, there's an idea of obsession going on in our locker room right now. They got a taste of what it can taste like of being a Big 12 champion, playing in a college football playoff, and we fell short. And this idea of obsession, the obsession that our players have is one that really came from them. They couldn't wait to get back to work. They couldn't wait to get back in the weight room. And when I took the job, I don't know if I could have said that. It was almost like kind of prodding cattle to make sure that what they were doing day in and day out to get them to that point. Now we've got a team full of hungry players. It's a competitive, competitive roster. Um, and and I, I love that about them because in this conference, you got to have depth. If you don't have depth and everybody wants to talk about the O and D line, yes, that's vitally important. And I think we've got great depth there. You got to have depth at quarterback. You got to have depth at running back. You have to have depth at safety. You have to have depth across the board. And for us to be able to sit here and say, this is the deepest team we've had, probably the most talented team we've had uh, in my four years here, I, I can unequivocally say that. And we lost some really good players a year ago, but we've got a very deep football team, um, one that we're excited about and uh, looking forward to watching them compete this fall. Of off the team, we've got three players here with us today. We've got Quinn Ewers uh, going into year three as our quarterback, a guy who has gotten better from year one to year two. He's really improved from year two to year three. He's changed his body. He looks great. He understands the system. But the thing that I'm probably most proud of him about is his leadership. This guy is exuding confidence right now, and there's nothing better for anybody in your organization, for anybody in your building to walk in and to say, there's our guy. And our guy's exuding confidence. He's carrying himself the right way. He's doing things the right way, not only on the field, but off the field. He's our leader. And uh, we can unequivocally say that about Quinn Ewers. And uh, I'm proud to have him with us today. He's got a great belt buckle on, if you guys haven't seen it yet, and some awesome boots, if, if you're wondering. Kelvin Banks is also with us today, uh, our left tackle, who's been a day one starter since he was a true freshman. Um, if there's anybody in our program that I would say, hey, go emulate that guy. The way he handles his business, on the field, off the field, the way he works, first guy there, last guy off the field, that's Kelvin Banks. Now, he's gonna be a high draft pick whenever that day comes, but the way he's carried himself has been super impressive, and his play shows on Saturdays, but it's who he is Sunday through Friday is really makes up why he plays the way on Saturday. And then Jade Barron's here with us as well, a guy who had a tough decision to come back for his senior season, came back. He's kind of the glue on the defense for us. He's heady, he's savvy, he can play multiple positions, he's tough. Um, I love what he brings to our team. I love the leadership that he brings to the team, and so we're we're lucky to have him. As far as our coaching staff goes, one thing that we have going for us is coordinator continuity. I've had the same coordinators in four years now here at Texas uh, with Kyle Flood on the offensive line, offensive coordinator. Uh, Pete Kwiatkowski is our defensive coordinator, and then Jeff Banks is our special teams coordinator. From an offensive perspective, if you haven't ever seen us play, we believe in balance. We even believe in trying to make it hard on the defense with multiple personnel groupings, formations, motion shifts. We love to run the football. We love to play action pass. We love to RPO. That's not going to change. Okay, so if you're wondering how is it going to look with the new headset communication thing, we aren't going to change. We're going to do what we do. We're just going to try to do it better than we did a year ago. Okay, defensively, um, 
I think one thing that we've really tried to evolve into, we, we've really tried to commit ourselves to stop in the run, and I think that showed a year ago, we have to be better in pass defense. And there's two ways to get better in pass defense. One, got to cover people better, right? You got to guard people better. You have to have people that can guard them. You also have to have the schemes to guard those people, but you have to have a better way to affect the quarterback. And so we've really tried to uh, invoke that into our team um, of how do we create more of a pass rush to affect the quarterback, which I think we've improved upon this year and, and we'll see the benefits of that. And then on special teams, um, you know, we're an aggressive special teams unit. We, we try to go block the kick. If we're not going to block the kick, we're going to try to return it for a touchdown. That's just the way we operate. And, and Coach Banks does a great job with that and looking forward to another great year. And when you have depth on your team like we have right now, uh, that's when your special teams can really start to rise up because we try to play our best players on special teams. And when you've got multiple good players, now that depth can permeate to special teams. And so we think we're going to be even better on teams than we've been in the bat in the past and we've been pretty good and in the end for our team we have to be mentally and physically tough and that's the way we preach that's what we teach that's the way we work that's the way we work in the off season that'll never change and for any of you who have ever been to austin texas in july and you start walking in dkr and running in dkr at four o'clock in the afternoon you better be mentally and physically tough and that's what our guys are doing right now i'd say a couple things in closing and then we, we get to questions. At the University of Texas, the standard is the standard, okay? Part of that standard is our culture, all right? Our culture is what makes us who we are. We take a lot of pride in our culture. We pour into our culture. We are a very connected group. We love one another. We work with one another. Uh, and that's not going to change, okay? But at the University of Texas, part of the standard being the standard is competing for championships, I'm up here talking about football, but it's at every sport. It's at every level. And so it, regardless of the conference, and that's to take nothing away from the SEC, our goal is to come into this conference and compete for a conference championship. That's, it is what it is. That's why you go to the University of Texas. So, so that won't change. And I, I want to leave you with this. When I, when I took the job at the University of Texas, and I walked into DKR, and one of the first signs I saw was a quote that, I, that I've put up now in my office that I'll, that I'll always and forever hold on to. The pride and winning tradition at the University of Texas shall not be entrusted to the weak nor the timid. And that's not going to change now that we've changed conferences. We're going to go attack this thing. Like I said, we've got a ton of respect for this conference and the teams in this conference, but we're going to go attack it and we're going to go try to win a conference championship because that's why we're at the University of Texas. So we're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to renewing rivalries with Texas A&M and with Arkansas. We're one of the few schools with realignment that has benefited from realignment that we've gotten some, some rivalries back. And so we're looking forward to those things as well. And uh, it's going to be a great year. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Hook them. Okay, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Grant, Edley, or Kylie. Coach, we're going to start over on the right-hand side on the near aisle. Dennis. Sark, hi. Dennis Dodd, CBS Sports. I, I think we all totally get why Arch would come to Texas and basically face the prospect of perhaps sitting for two years, you know, the support system he's got, everything. But I wonder if you could just recount with that conversation was like that that may be the case that you're going to get the training you're going to get enough reps and experience here to get where you want to go well i think that's something you know historically for us you know part of recruiting is your track record and we've been fortunate to, to coach some pretty good quarterbacks we've been fortunate to do it for kind of some decades now we've been fortunate to have some pretty good quarterback rooms and I think the Manning family is pretty well aware of that and I think they trained Arch to try to put himself in the best position to try to play in the best conference in America um, and then ultimately put himself in the best position to you know further his career playing in the National Football League and so um, with that you know, I think Arch's development has been important to the family and he's reaping the benefit of those things. And so um, it hasn't been very difficult at all. I think it's been pretty simple for him. Coach, we're going to go straight in front of me about four rows back. Kirk. Uh, Kirk Bowles from the Houston Chronicle. You haven't used a big rotation in your receivers, it seemed like, and with good reason. You don't want to take Xavier and AD off the field. But with so many in the portal, so many young receivers coming in, including Wingo, 
might you expand your rotation and play more of them, or it just makes it more competitive in practice? I, I think it's probably twofold, Kurt. I, I, we're gonna, we are gonna play more receivers. I think the the, the length of this season, um, and because of not having all of the rapport with Quinn, some of that I have to feel out as games go. It is a very talented room for sure. And we've got three great transfers. When you talk about Isaiah Bond, Matthew Golden, Silas Bolden, three really experienced, good football players that came from good programs. We had signed a very good class the year before with John T. Cook, DeAndre Moore, and Ryan Niblett. And then with this incoming class, uh, I think it's pretty fair to say Ryan Wingo is a really good player for us. And so to think that I've got seven quality players there, now is it going to be a seven-man rotation? That'll, that'll bear itself out. But I do think we'll play more players than we have in the past. We'll rotate more guys than we probably have in the past. Um, and then as we work ourselves through the season, when you, when you start playing this many games, I'd love to tell you we're not going to get injuries. Injuries are going to occur. So we're going to play more players probably earlier in the season than we have um, just because you don't have some of that experience that we lost from a year ago. But this isn't a lack of talent. This, this group is very talented and by far and away our deepest receiver core that we've had in four years. Coach, we're going to go to the section to your right on the aisle. Hey, Steve, Cedric Golden, Austin, American Statesman. Um, there's a lot of Heisman hype with Quinn and uh, Carson Beck. Uh, how does his demeanor make him ideal to deal with all that external noise? Um, you know, I, I think Quinn's probably like the coolest guy in the room. You know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't get caught up in what a Heisman hype. I, I probably, if you asked him, would he even know? You know, he's just not caught up in that stuff. When Quinn gets free time, he's going to go hunt or he's going to go fish. You know, when he's here, he's going to work, you know, and he's, he's just working on his craft. He's being with his teammates. And so um, even in game, when you think about Quinn, when he shows those moments of emotion, right, on a great throw, it's almost like shocking to people because even when the bad moments occur, he stays so calm and so cool in the moment that with the hype, um, I just don't think we have to worry too much about that. You know, he's more focused on trying to win a championship, playing the best football he can play, being the best leader, the best teammate he can be. Um, that, that's probably more important to him than what award might be down the road because some people are saying he might win it. I mean, there's so much football to go play. I don't think he's worried about it at all. We'll stay in that center section on the right-hand aisle, Kylie. Sarka, Ralph Russo from the Associated Press. Uh, I, I know you probably would have loved to have hit the ground running and won 12 games in year one, but what changed over those two years building up to year three? Why was year three so much different? Why did it click? Well, I think part of it was our culture. We had to keep building our culture, the things that were important to us, right? And that takes time. Um, it takes time to learn the schemes. You know, you bring in coaches and you, and you have an idea of what you want to run, and that's nothing against a previous staff, but maybe they didn't recruit the types of players that fit what we wanted to be and how we wanted to play. So that takes time too. Um, there's development of players in your program. And so, hey, I'll, I'll tell you this much, five and seven in Austin, Texas sucks. That was hard. <laughs> that was hard on me. That was hard on players. That was hard on a lot of people. Okay, eight and five was a little more palatable for people, right? Um, but as you continue to stay committed to who you are and you stay committed to your course of action, you stay committed to what you believe in, over time you start to reap the benefits of that. With that comes sometimes you have to, people that were supposed to be good players when you arrived maybe aren't playing as much and maybe the guy that fit you a little bit better you have to recognize and you have to play him a little bit more but everybody earned their opportunity in our program over the past three years and the beauty of it has been our players recognize that and then now they know the process to go make it to make it work i was telling somebody earlier today about a story about the leaders on our team you know when we had B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson, everybody raved about their leadership ability, but we only had a couple of leaders. Last year, we raved about the leadership of about five or six guys, Jordan Winningtons of the world, right? Byron Murphy's of the world. This year, I could probably tell you, I got 25 leaders because these guys have grown up in our program. They don't know any different than our culture. 
And so now when I don't even have to speak very long about what we believe in because they live it every single day and I watch them live it every single day. And so that's the process, right? You're trying to develop leadership. Well, leadership takes time to develop. You just don't anoint a guy a leader if he doesn't believe in the core values of the organization. Which we're going to go straight in the front of my section about midway back. Steve, Eric, Henry, Horns, 24-7. Kind of piggybacking off of Kirk's question. Last year, you talked a lot about the versatility of the team and helping you win games with JB gone and the receivers and JT. Just wondering, what do you see as the next kind of natural evolution for the offense? Well, I think, you know, without telling Coach Norvell at Colorado State what we're going to do in week one, um, you know, part of it is we always try to stay on the cutting edge. You know, I, I never want to get stale offensively. And I know what I said earlier, we're going to be who we are. But with that comes all of the subtle tweaks and, and things and formations and motions and personnel groupings and how do you group people the right way and um, to take advantage of it. Part of that is trying to play your best players. All right. Part of that is to how do we tax the defense? Um, and so we do have a very versatile offensive team. You know, the fact that you know, we, we've got very versatile runners. We've got versatile tight ends. The addition of Amari Nyblack has been great. Uh, Juan Davis, who I've been so impressed with coming out of spring ball and this summer. Uh, Gunnar Helm, we found out a lot about him when JT went down last year. Um, we use an extra tackle at tight end some. So we try to do a lot of things to people to make them prepare for it. And then in game, what are we going to call that game that maybe they didn't practice quite as much or, hey, they have a deficiency here. Let's go attack that a little bit more. So I, I, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but sometimes it's we implement an offense and then we tap into different aspects of it from week to week that we think, you know, behoove us to be successful. So we're going to go into the section to your right, uh, just midway back. Olin. Yeah. Olin Buchanan, uh, Tex Tex Coach, you have the unique experience of having coached in the Iron Bowl and the Red River, uh, I'm sorry, Red River rivalry. Now, uh, last month, and uh, Destin, your athletic director, said the uh, Texas Oklahoma game was uh, was a bigger game, a bigger event than the Iron Bowl. So, what is it about that game that makes it a bigger event than the Iron Bowl or other SEC rivalry games? Well, I, I think this, and I, I've been fortunate. Like I said, I've been I've been part of the Iron Bowl. Uh, I've been part of the Apple Cup in Washington. I've been part of SC, UCLA. I've been part of some great games. This is the most unique game for sure that I've ever been a part of. Um, when, you, when you pull into the state fair and you start smelling those corn dogs and turkey legs and, and there's fans from both teams and, and then you get in those locker rooms and the locker rooms literally are 20 feet apart and you're staring at each team and one goes first, and the next one goes next and it can get a little contentious in there, but, th but that's okay. Um, and as we come out, we come out of that tunnel and that's OU's tunnel and we're staring at a sea of burnt orange and you just want to get there. And it's a unique game because half of the game is a home game. The other half of the game is a road game. And I had to learn that the hard way in year one. We got stuck in OU's end and we were false start and we couldn't do anything right. And so you have to play to that style of game. But it being split right down the 50, it's the who's who on the sidelines. And I'll tell you this about both teams. Both teams play as hard as they possibly can play in that game. And again, that's to take nothing away from any other great game that I've been part of, but this one is uniquely special. I think Norman's about two and a half hours from Dallas. We're about three hours from Dallas. And uh, the fact that we kind of come upon the state fair here in, in, uh, in Dallas is, uh, is, is really special. And so it's a game that I'm, I'm humbled and honored that I get to be part of. Uh, I'm getting to go coach in my fourth one and um, looking forward to the opportunity. Rich, we're going to go over to the right side on this near aisle. Sean, Jay Roger from CBS Sports. Uh, coach, you mentioned rivalry games, of course. Uh, since you've been here, what have you heard about the Texas A&M rivalry and what kind of buzz is there for this game coming back? Well, it's a, it's a great game. It's a game that, like I said, divides households um, and um, one that, uh, you know, it's interesting. As I, our players, I listen to our players talk sometimes, and they're like, our players are probably way more excited for this game than most fans would probably think because we haven't played the game in a while. But the majority of the players on our two rosters 
probably went on visits together at, if not one school, both schools. And one guy chose Texas and one guy chose A&M. And so uh, I think there's a great deal of excitement. Um, I know Coach Elko has done a great job in that program in a short time being there. It's going to be a great environment in Kyle Field uh, Thanksgiving weekend. So we're, we're definitely looking forward to it. Okay, we have time for one more. We're going to go right here in front. Jenny. Hey, Steve. Jenny Carlson with Beyond the Box Score. Obviously, what you guys have done in the last three years, building momentum, building belief, you wanted to do that anyway. But taking that into the SEC, on the list of intangibles, how important do you feel like that is for your program? Well, it's critical. This is an elite conference. <laughs> it's going to take week in and week out work ethic, preparation, innovation, toughness, mental toughness, physical toughness, perseverance, uh, mental fortitude, if you get knocked down to get back up, like it's gonna take all the stuff we went through the last three years and put it in one year um, because that's what this conference challenges you on. You, you're, you're playing at an elite level week in and week out. And I think that's, that's what those three years have to roll into this year. And um, that's, that's my challenge as a coach, is to, to, is to get our team in that frame of mind, but yet still enjoy the experience. There's nothing like playing college football. It's the greatest sport in the world, and I, I know we're going through all sorts of different changes right now, but the, the popularity and the excitement around college football right now is bigger and better than it's ever been. Okay, and so through all that, all that stuff I just talked about, I want to make sure our players enjoy this. I mean, you think about it. I talked about three rivalry games in one season. How many schools get to say that? And so uh, we're looking forward to it. It's, uh, it's going to be a great opportunity and look forward to seeing you all. Uh, and if you haven't been to the Red Rivalry game, you should come. It's an amazing game. Appreciate you all. Hook them. Thank you. Thank you, it? Coach. Thank you very much.